So uh, thank you for having me and thanks for the, uh, that was an excellent report, Susan, that actually sort of um, covered some of what I was going to cover. This has been uh, a little bit of a difficult week to attempt to summarize US politics <laughs> as I was um, trying to sort of put together an outline over, over the course of the week, everything changed fairly dramatically uh, day by day. So I'm just going to um, uh, address a few questions and I'm not sure if I'll be able to venture really a comprehensive view of US politics because it's, I think that that would be, um, there's a, a little hubristic to think that uh, with so many um, moving factors, it's it's uh, kind of impossible to do. But uh, so just go, going on to this week, week, the question of whether this was a real coup attempt or um, political theater. I think that this was um, the uh, attack or whatever you want to call it on the Capitol uh, this Wednesday. U.S. Capitol was the last attempt of a long effort by Trump and his supporters to hold on to the presidency um, with increasing desperation. Uh, so they started with relatively traditional Republican techniques like vote suppression, um, uh, sort of uh, messing with uh, the Postal Service and, and uh, interrupting mail-in voting, preparing for court challenges and so on. And as it became more desperate, um, uh, it, it led to, um, like Susan alluded to uh, earlier in the week, there was a statement by all uh, living secretaries of defense saying, you know, the Department of Defense cannot uh, violate the U.S. Constitution. So it's clear that there were various things going on behind the scenes of seeing what he could do to remain in power. And what ultimately happened was this, um, you know, sort of a few thousand people uh, rushing the Capitol to delay the uh, certification vote. Um, I think that traditional elements of a coup, of a successful coup, like allegiance of sections of the military apparatus, uh, obviously wasn't present. Uh, there is broad support for Trump among police across the country. Um, so it's at least plausible, if not likely, that there was uh, collusion from members of the D.C. police, the Capitol police, um, but seemingly not, uh, you know, a large organized conspiracy, probably more in the, you know, in, in, in the arena of, of individual actors, um, but I'm sure that will be investigated. Uh, and in fact, I think that something that may impact those allegiances are the fact that there was a member of the Capitol Police um, killed in the scuffle, uh, died um, earlier today or yesterday. So it's also to me uncertain about whether Trumpism or how specifically Trumpism will be weakened or emboldened by all of this. In the immediate short term, um, the things that are sort of dominating the headlines, Trumpism has been weakened and isolated politically within the Republican party. Um, and in some ways this is almost like a reset to the 2016 uh, Republican presidential primaries where you had an allegiance of all of these various institutional actors in the Republican Party going against Trump. Um, since then, there had been kind of a pragmatic adaptation to temp uh, opportunistic allegiance with Trump. Mitch McConnell, the Speaker of the House, is the uh, best example of this. Um, they had already begun to distance themselves uh, in the in the past couple of weeks, and that's only going to accelerate. And similarly organizations of the capitalist class, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, which is even more right-wing than the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, have issued public denunciations of Trump, uh, even as far as calling on um, Pence to, to um, invoke the 25th Amendment and, and uh, oust Trump in the last two weeks of his term. Um, so, Trumpism is, is sort of isolated in that way as well. And then there was, of course, the statement from all of the surviving um, secretaries of defense. And finally, as of uh, a couple of hours ago, he was permanently banned from Twitter, which is his main um, sort of mouthpiece and uh, 
way that he communicates with his audience. So there, there have been these various institutional moves to isolate Trump and Trumpism. Um, and I think that there's also an anticipation among those forces and in, in transitioning to a Biden administration, which kind of, which sees, uh, you know, bipartisanship and cooperation across the aisle and so forth as a kind of religion. So um, just moving on to the next administration. However, it remains to be seen how, how effective this will be at lower levels. Um, a poll on Wednesday suggested that nearly half of Republican voters approved of the attack on the Capitol building. And even after that attack, about a quarter of Congress people uh, voted for um, challenge at least one of the challenges to the election result, uh, which is symbolically just a display of allegiance to Trump. So this is altogether, you know, fine with him finally announcing yesterday that he will recognize the transition of power. This brings to a close this chapter of Donald Trump in power. Uh, but it's, it's really too early to say, I think, what the impact of that will be, whether this will be seen as a, you know, a heroic charge in defense of a um, stolen election or whether there will be a scattering of forces. It, 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 could, it could really go either way. I think that the story of the past four years has been a real shift to, towards Trump as kind of a cult figure of the far right um, with massive support in the tens of millions of hardcore of, of uh, millions of supporters, but at the same time, um, within that big sea of, of uh, right wing, fascistic, right populist, other um, ideas, there haven't been the, there hasn't been the coherence of uh, strong fascist street organizations or. Um, anything like that. They can't really keep themselves together. They can't. This was, in fact, the first, um, the past few months is am are among the first times that they've been able to put significant numbers in the streets and sort of uh, not be repelled by, um, by the left in the streets. And potentially that could even be just a factor of the pandemic. They're much more comfortable operating and um, mobilizing in, in these conditions. So, um, so whether this will rally uh, people to their cause or um, scatter and weaker, weaken them, I think either of those is possible and it's really not clear at this point. Uh, it's also not clear what, what the future of this movement is without Trump as a figure. I mean, obviously he's, he's uh, so he's not the president anymore. He's still going to be broadcasting ideas and so forth, but um, he's not going to live forever. And, and something that's been kind of emblematic of it is that he hasn't been, uh, is, is, it, it really is a, sort of a cult type of um, movement where he can elevate and then squash anybody else uh, overnight. And there, haven't, there has not allowed the emergence of any other um, lasting leaders or any organization. So, um, so we will have to see. So on to the Biden administration, um, he's by now announced, I think, the majority or all of the members of his cabinet. Uh, that's a pretty slow, that's slower than normal. Um, and it's possible that his administration won't actually have confirmed appointments um, until, you know, sometime uh, late January or in, into February. Uh, by and large, they're or in, across the board, they're the kind of pro-corporate figures you would expect. Um, the Biden administration, uh, like the Biden campaign, uh, has been generally um, impervious to any influence from the left. And I think that the immediate, uh, another difficulty with kind of sussing out what will the uh, agenda, what will the Biden administration agenda be is that he uh, doesn't really have a clear political program um, other than, you know, vague generalities of a return to Obama area, era uh, um, bipartisan politics and so forth. His, his role in the primary was to be the anti-Sanders and then his role in the general election was to be the anti-Trump. 
um, and neither of those was wedded to a particularly strong uh, international or domestic um, political program. And furthermore, the fact that the, the uh, short-term priorities or short-term kind of emergency situation will be dealing with the the reality of the pandemic, uh, which is quite severe at this point. We're now up to about 4,000 deaths a day, which will likely continue to increase. Um, and meanwhile, Biden has, has uh, not indicated any willingness to take the kind of um, quarantine measures that would be necessary to contain it. So that will continue to shape uh, US politics for the coming months. And um, and yeah, so it's sort of uh, difficult to see, see where that goes because at some point it, it really will spiral out of control without significant measures taken, but there's no movement to take those at this point, even um, as is about be, being done in the UK, for example. Um, so yeah, the, then the final couple of things that um, Alex mentioned that I might want to min talk about are uh, this force the vote um, uh, movement. I'm, I'm not sure what you would call it. For the force the, the vote phenomenon um, about a procedural tactic to force a vote on Medicare for all by the a uh, small number of um, left-wing members of Congress. Uh, that effect, I mean, I think that essentially that um, uh, just broke on the shore uh, last weekend when Nancy Pelosi, the, the, the tactic was supposed to be demanding that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other left-wing Congress people um, condition their vote for Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House on uh, bringing Medicare for all bill to a floor vote, which would certainly fail when taken to a vote, but then the logic goes would expose uh, who who was really going to vote for and against it and open up the potential for um, uh, challenging uh, those who were not for it in the future. Um, so Nancy Pelosi was unanimously selected as this Democrat Speaker of the House, uh, including by the left-wing members, which in my opinion was is a, an, an error, but I also don't think that the force of the vote, um, that that tactic uh, was a really clear assessment of how, it, it, it wasn't clear what the, what the actual longer term strategy for that would be. Um, there's not, there, there wasn't an alternative to, uh, you know, in, in immediate prag pragmatic terms, there was not an alternative to Nancy Pelosi's left um, for Speaker of the House. So it's a very weak bargaining hand to say, uh, to not vote for her on some condition because she could just say, you know, and then what? Um, so I think that it was a, a sort of muddled, confused initiative, but it did speak to, uh, in fact, the I think that the, to the extent it had some appeal online, it spoke to the uh, desperation that people feel to um, uh, bring progressive legislation to a vote. And uh, in, in my opinion, it sort of puts into relief the fact that there isn't a clear um, strategy from the left on advancing uh, many of our initiatives at this point. I think that the the past um, six months or so has really kind of blindsided uh, the left in the US. And so um, uh, my assumption is that in the, in the first couple of, you know, in the, in the coming months of the um, Biden administration, uh, there will be a re reconfiguration of, of that. I think that the um, collapse of the Sanders campaign was a real disaster. And while the Black Lives Matter movement um, and sort of social explosion this summer was inspiring, it left very little organizational um, coherence behind. And so uh, my hope is, is that we can sort of get our acts together and re reorient towards um, non-electoral uh, activities, which I think is, is now, um, 
really seems to have monopolized the attention of, of much of the left in the US.